they have two bad choices uh, to survive. One, work in the garment factory, which is by far the largest employer, or two, uh, work in the sex industry. There aren't a lot of other options for women there. Hi everybody, I'm Andrew Glazer, senior producer for Vice News, uh, and I'm here to talk about two stories that I produced this past year about human trafficking and labor exploitation in Asia. I'm really looking forward to having a good conversation, so let's get started with some good questions. Hey Andrew, thanks for coming on the show today. Sure. Um, we have a, a bunch of people who are excited to talk to you, and the first person is Regina, who is calling us from Washington, D.C. on Skype. So let's say to Regina. Hey. Hey, so I have a couple of questions. My first one being that in Cambodia, Sarush was asked by the management to help negotiate the contract with the workers. And in that way, he kind of inserted himself in the story he was reporting on. And so my question about that is, why did you allow for the journalist to insert himself in that situation? Uh, well, it happened naturally. To, uh, we never obviously set out to do that. We didn't even know we were going to be getting into the into the garment factory uh, until it happened. And uh, then he was sort of pushed in front of the workers by the uh, by the owners of the garment factory who thought that he was going to present their story to the workers. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what was going through their minds, but this was all playing out and advice what we're comfortable with is uh, is being transparent. This is really what happened. We didn't set it up. It happened. Um, and he actually kind of jujitsu it into a, a great uh, group interview. I mean, they, they expected him again to deliver their message to the thousand or so workers that were in attendance. And instead, he turned it around and used it as an opportunity to say, this is what the owner of the company is saying about what your conditions are like and what you're getting paid. Is it true? Uh, and you can see uh, in the clip uh, that we're about to show that uh, they, they uh, actually felt pretty strongly that it was not true. So uh, if you want, let's watch the clip. I had no intention of being a mouthpiece of the factory management. So I took this opportunity to ask the workers directly what they are actually paid. Your bosses here are saying that the minimum wage in this country is about eighty dollars, and that you are actually getting paid one seventy-five to two hundred. Is that correct? So I, I really think it was a great way to uh, see really the, the disconnect between what the owners of the factories were trying to sell us and sell their workers and what the reality was. You can see on their faces. And so uh, it happened in a real natural way. We didn't set it up and, and uh, we thought it was worth, worth keeping in there. Okay. And then my second question is about going to Japan now. Um, in the last story in Japan, the woman... Um, the correspondent is speaking with um, one of the women, and she is explaining how she's been sexually harassed by management there. Um, and then he asks her what her biggest fear is, and she says it's her union and it's the union representative. And so I'm wondering if you were able to speak to the unions about that and why the choice was made to, I guess, talk to the guy that's sexually harassing her versus the person that's threatening to kill her. So, yeah, that's my question. Sure. Uh, let's play the clip of, the, of her interview uh, for a second so we can get some context, and then I'm happy to answer the question. Sure. What's your biggest worry now? What are you afraid of the most? I'm afraid of having no work. Um, 
All right, so to answer your question, uh, we were unable to get in touch with that union. Uh, and that was just one, it, it, the, it, that was kind of a local union that represents some of the agricultural workers. And anecdotally, we heard similar uh, heavy handed accusation, accusations of being heavy handed from other workers as well, uh, other foreign workers uh, speci specifically. Um, we couldn't reach them. Uh, we did reach out to the uh, guy who was her employer uh, because we could we could find him and she made accusations not only uh, to us verbally but formally in in writing uh, to the Japanese government it was a, a formal grievance so we thought that it was important that he answer those accusations and uh, that's why we showed up at his place and, and asked him to uh, which he, he to to his uh, he, he actually denied the accusations so uh, so that was the story there. All right, and so then I guess in the two cases, can you talk more broadly about the role of unions and if you think that overall they contribute more to worker well-being or like in these situations, do they make things worse? Uh, it, it's, there's kind of a, many answers to that because I'll start with Cambodia. In Cambodia, we had spoken to some of the union leaders representing garment workers and uh, they, the allegations that we heard from the workers that they represent is that these union leaders had been co-opted. Uh, and if you look at their public uh, posture, uh, it's not that far of a stretch to, to believe that. And when I say co-opted, that they were receiving, this is allegations that we couldn't confirm, um, but the allegations are that they were receiving kickbacks from the companies that uh, employ these garment workers and therefore uh, their, their interests are conflicted. Um, so in that case, I can't say that uh, one way or the other, I can't confirm one way or the other, but I do know that they don't have the confidence of their employ of their members, their union members, which are the garment uh, workers. They don't have the confidence of, of their union representatives. Uh, sorry, the, the workers do not, are, are not confident that the union representatives are representing their interests. They believe, okay. they believe that they are representing the interests of the garment factories, the employers. Uh, Conversely, when we, we also were working with sex workers in Cambodia, and they have unions. In fact, the, we talked to two union representatives that represent thousands of sex workers in Cambodia. And I'm pretty confident, not only based on just uh, talking to them and talking to the sex workers that they represent, that they are really looking after these women, uh, but they also seem to really understand the women's plight. And we, they were able to give us really good data on numbers of women who were, who were trafficked. Uh, they allege that uh, a relatively small percentage of the sex workers in Cambodia were trafficked, which is kind of the irony that we were exploring in this piece, uh, and that, that most had made this horrible choice. They, they didn't have a lot of choices. They have two bad choices uh, to survive. One, work in the garment factory, which is by far the largest employer, or two, uh, work in the sex industry. There aren't a lot of other options for women there, uh, and so it was pretty tragic. So I, I was pretty confident that the unions uh, in Cambodia, the, sec the unions representing the sex workers in Cambodia, were doing very good work, uh, and and really cared about the women that they were looking after. Uh, in Japan, um, we talked specifically about the one union representing agricultural workers that uh, we couldn't get in touch with, and it was alleged that they were threatening some of the workers. We did work with unions representing some of the migrant workers, and they're in fact uh, one of the, the, the head of that, one of those unions uh, features prominently in our piece. It's, it's a man named Tori Ipe, who has been recognized uh, internationally and by the U.S. State Department as someone who is one of the few uh, outspoken voices looking after, looking for the best interests of these migrants, um, of these international interns. So he's doing uh, great work as far as, as I can see. All right, thanks very Thank much. You. Nice talking to you. Yeah, thanks for coming on, Regina. So, uh, Andrew, we got some other questions that were sent us. Uh, we have a Skype video message from Clifton that I want you to take a listen to. So let's take a listen to that. Hi, Andrew, my name is Clifton, and I had a couple questions I hope you'll be able to answer. The first one, were you able to find out which Western brands are associated with these sweatshops? And the second question, in these areas where the sweatshops are located, were you able to find out if there are any other means of employment? Thank you very much, and I look forward to your answers. Hey, uh, Clifton, thanks very much for the question. Um, quick answer is uh, we 
in, when we were in the actual factory that we were in, uh, we could see boxes and shipping labels and uh, documents that showed that these clothes were being made for Old Navy, Benetton, H&M, and Russell Athletics. Uh, and then we went and confirmed that by looking at bills of lading, which are often um, public documents. So we found those. Um, we wanted to be sure that we confirmed that. Uh, so that's, that is uh, where these, this particular manufacturer was making clothes for. Um, we, as far as other job opportunities, uh, Cambodia is extremely poor. There is not a lot of, uh, there aren't a lot of opportunities, which is why, tragically, uh, most women have to choose between these two horrible uh, jobs, working in a garment factory for very low wages, long hours, and uh, back-breaking uh, labor, uh, or doing uh, sex work, which is, which is obviously a horrible uh, a choice as well. Um, so so that was, that's a major problem. Cool. Uh, so, you know, Andrew, we got another video message I want you to take a listen to. Great. Uh, this one's from Ari, and Ari is also curious about some stuff in Cambodia. So let's take a listen. Great. Hi, Andrew. My name's Ari. I'm wondering why you think that sex work in particular uh, brings out this type of visceral reaction, especially from human rights activists, especially in the West, uh, this idea that it, the industry needs to be shut down, that uh, the workers need to be somehow rescued. We don't see that kind of uh, reaction in the other industry, especially the garment industry, where there's also atrocious uh, labor rights violations. We uh, in, Instead, we look to change the industry to make it better, to raise wages. Why do you think uh, the two things uh, have very different reactions from human rights activists? Uh, well, I think that's a great question, and that was kind of the premise of our piece. And, and uh, I want to preface my answer by saying these are both horrible uh, choices. The, both jobs are terrible. Uh, and one of the ironies that we wanted to point out is in this piece is that there's been an enormous amount of pressure from the West, and particularly from the U.S. State Department in the case of Cambodia, for Cambodia to address this human trafficking problem, um, which our reporting uh, and the reporting of United Nations study that came out in 2011 and other independent studies found is, is, is grossly overstated. Uh, again, women selling their bodies for next to nothing is a horrible choice. But what we learned in our reporting is that many of these women actually had chosen that job over garment work. I, I don't want to say that they chose that profession because life hasn't given them choices but they chose it over garment work. And so the irony that we were exploring is that this program that Cambodia was doing that ostensibly is rescuing these women from prostitution, from human trafficking uh, and retraining them for a new profession, uh, in many ways was rescuing them from a job that they didn't want to be rescued from. They were working for themselves and pushing them into a profession that they had, had chosen to, to bypass. Uh, and I want to show you guys a clip. Um, it's a worker that we talked to who, who is, uh, illustrates this. She, she was a, uh, a sex worker who was rescued, forced into the garment trade, and, and uh, went back. And here's her story. After Polly's arrest, police released her into the custody of a local NGO that would prepare her for her new career. So were you making any money while you were in the training? So one of the things that we really uh, wanted to explore is that this uh, program that's supposed to be giving women, uh, that's supposed to be helping women is, is in many ways, in many cases, at least the cases that we saw, uh, is, is taking away their agency. They had, they had chosen sex work over garment work, and now they were uh, being forced into garment work. Uh, and again, it wasn't just a few people that we talked to. Uh, we talked to, as I mentioned before, we talked to uh, union representatives uh, for the sex workers who are in contact with uh, thousands of sex workers. And they were extremely critical of this rescue program. Uh, so, so that was, uh, to us, pretty, pretty interesting. And, th and that was the basis of the story. Um, so, uh, any other questions, guys? Yeah, we we got a couple other things. Um, you know, Barbara Smith actually 
uh, texted us, or tweeted us rather. She didn't text us anything. Uh, she tweeted us this question: "Don't leave us in suspense, Andrew. Tell us how did you actually gain access to the Cambodian sweatshops?" Uh, well, it wasn't easy, uh, and it's a case of, of kind of making luck and, and seizing it when we when it was presented to us. Um, we had tried for weeks to get permission to film in the sweatshop, and uh, actually I should call them garment factories because sweatshop is kind of a loaded term. We, we had tried for weeks uh, through various uh, representatives of the garment factories. There's a guy who is in charge of, of uh, sort of the coalition of garment factory owners. And uh, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. Uh, no one allowed us to get in to film there. Uh, and uh, there hasn't been a lot of video footage in these places, and I think that should uh, indicate that the, whoever owns these places doesn't think it's a, a worth the, or the world shouldn't see it, uh, that they have stuff to hide. That's generally my, my assumption in these cases. Uh, so what we did was we uh, basically, uh, there was a, this, this rally outside of one of the garment factories and the women had gathered in front. This was after a pretty tense morning where uh, some thugs who we never quite identified where they came from had uh, beaten some of the protesters. The women were angry uh, and they were outside and Sarush, the host, asked how it, what would it take to get inside, and they uh, said, follow us, and, and they invited him in, uh, pushed their way in, actually. And once we were in there, the owners of the garment factory, rather than kicking us out, welcomed us with water and, and uh, brought us into their conference room and, and told their story for a while. So uh, we can show a clip here showing that actually happening in real time. We wanted to see the factory conditions that led these women to strike. But these factories are notoriously difficult to get into, especially with cameras. Can you take me inside? Solidarity. We are not allowed in this factory, but if the workers all protect us, then we can go in. So they're taking us in, stirring up the pot a little bit. Security guys making calls right now. Before long, someone from management showed up to greet us. So, uh, yeah, then we were in there. Uh, the one downside is that because most of the workers were, uh, had walked out, uh, when we got inside, there, wasn't, there weren't a lot of people uh, who were working. Um, also, I think if we were to come in on any average day, it's kind of hard to get a feel for how bad life is there. It's really a, a, an extended uh, condition of heat and poor pay and no lunch breaks. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, when you get in there, look uh, awful, uh, although it certainly doesn't look nice and, and everyone's standing on their feet all day. Um, but it's not, you, you kind of have to understand what the, what the, the conditions are like for these women uh, and they're not necessarily visual. Uh, so thanks for the great question. Cool. So speaking of great questions, I know uh, Loic has some great questions for you. So let's say hey to him. Hi, Andrew. Uh, thanks for having me. Hey. I just had a couple of questions. I wanted to pivot back to uh, Japan uh, for a few minutes. Uh, my first question is, how politically tenable do you think it is uh, for continued opposition uh, for immigration reform and work visa reform in Japan? And at what point will the labor gap become drastic enough to change that equation? Um, as far as I can tell, and that's a great question, um, Japan doesn't show any inclination to open its society up to more immigrants, uh, particularly with the current right-wing government, um, for, by basis of comparison. Uh, Japan has about 2% uh, of its population is foreign-born. Uh, the U.S. and the U.K. have about 12 or 13%. So Japan has been very resistant for its existence, its modern existence at least, uh, to uh, allowing immigrants to come in in a formal kind of, uh, giving, them, giving them formal immigration status. Um, so Japan shows no signs of, of uh, changing that anytime soon. Um, the way they are, seem to be handling their labor shortage, um, because also this problem is compounded with uh, a, an aging population that's among the oldest in the world. Um, they're bringing in these interns, and, and uh, so for the Olympics right now, there's about 150,000 foreign workers who are in Japan working under this internship program. And uh, the government wants to expand it to include another 70,000 uh, 
migrant workers to come in as interns for Olympic preparation. The Olympics are in 2020 and they have a lot of work to do. So uh, they're opening up the program to 70,000 more workers. So you would think that with this huge labor shortage and, and uh, it's projected to get even worse in the next uh, several decades, uh, rather than um, dealing with the system, they seem to have the stopgap measure of bringing interns in from abroad. Right. And speaking more specifically about the Olympics, uh, in the run-up to the Olympics, how attentive has the Japanese news media been to this issue, or is there a level of uh, complicity or inattentiveness? Uh, and you expect that to shift uh, as we get closer? Uh, I only know uh, what I saw, and, and I mm -hmm. talked to some reporters in advance of this who I was trying to recruit to help me out with some of this uh, reporting, and no one seemed to know about it. Every time I brought it up, it was something that was news to them. It has gotten uh, some coverage in the States, but amazingly, the Japanese public and even, uh, and I guess as a result of the Japanese reporters not knowing much about it, it, it just seems to be kind of a blank spot. Uh, and whether the reason for that, I don't know if it's because uh, the Japanese media has not been critical about this, if it's just so uh, established, or really what the reason for that is. But uh, I can share with you one, one uh, insight. There was one uh, very well-known investigative reporter that we were talking to in advance of this, who we were talking about maybe working with us. She didn't know anything about it, um, but has since, based on me presenting this story to her, is now uh, kicking off her own investigation. So uh, hopefully the, you know, the, the, it's an important story and hopefully uh, the Japanese public will, will learn more about it. Right. And in that same vein, uh, if I can follow up, uh, in the run-up to Qatar's bid for the World Cup, we've seen wide coverage from human rights groups and international news media. Uh, but of course, as you said, this is uh, very much under the radar, the story. How do you, what do you ascribe that differential to? It's a great uh, question. I think, I think in part people kind of expect, uh, and I say this, uh, it's, it's a sad thing, but I think the Gulf states have a long legacy of exploiting workers from uh, abroad. Uh, that, that's a reality that's gotten a lot of coverage. And so when Qatar got the Olympics, I think everyone was ready to, to look out for what they were doing. And, and there were some lots of deaths and some extreme cases. I don't think Japan has had that critical mass yet. There hasn't been, uh, as far as I know, I mean, the Olympics are just starting construction right now and demolition, so it's really the beginning. Uh, and I don't think a lot of people have really paid attention. And I think Japan also uh, is the world's third largest economy. And uh, I guess the assumption is that they're doing better. Uh, and uh, that assumption is wrong as far as we could see. Great. Well, thank you. No, thank you. Those great questions. So uh, thanks a lot for coming on. And Andrew, thank you for coming on. You made it all the way to the end of the show. Thanks very much. It was a lot of fun. It was great talking to everyone. Look forward to doing it again. It's crazy when you go into a, a big retailer in America and you can find a hoodie for like 10 bucks. Like if you think about it, how could it be that cheap? The only way is that the people who are making the product are getting paid peanuts. And that's what's going on here.